Good morning. Um, welcome to this lesson on biological classification uh, and the binomial system. Uh, this is module 4.3. It's the first lesson of module 4.3 from the OCR A-level biology syllabus. Okay, so to start off, I'd like you to think about which of these four different pairs of uh, animals are the most closely related. Have a think. Write it down. Okay, so hopefully you've got an idea. Now, I'm not going to tell you the answer just yet, but we're going to come to that later. Um, but first of all, if you did think it was the bottom right-hand corner, um, those two are actually very distantly related. So on the top, we have an outline of a great white shark, um, still alive today. And underneath, we have an ichthyosaur. So that's an extinct um, reptile species, kind of was around when the dinosaurs were. And it has a similar sort of external appearance um, to the great white shark, but it's extremely, extremely distantly related. One's a reptile, one's a fish. So this kind of starts to think about um, basically the problems with classification. When we're trying to group animals together, um, how do we do so? Do we just look at their shape, for example? Um, or do we have to go a little bit deeper uh, and think about other considerations? So let's move on. This, I wanted to start with um, this image because this is one of my favorite images uh, in all of biology, really. This is actually a map uh, or a diagram representing how every single living creature is completely linked and related to every single other living creature on the planet. This actually kind of spirals out from the very center here. So in the center here is the first life. This is called the last universal common ancestor. And then as it moves further out outwards, um, we're getting um, moving through time. We're moving more and more closer to the present day. And when we reach the outer circle, it's all the life forms that are around on the present day. So um, we're going to be looking at this a little bit later in a few lessons time and, and really trying to understand this. But we're just one tiny little end point of all these little branches. Um, I'm not quite sure where we are actually on here. I think it'd probably be around about here somewhere is where we are. So more on that later. To start with, let's think about how you could classify all these different organisms into groups which you're choosing. Uh, you can include uh, me, a human being, in this uh, in this group. How might you classify all these living things? Have a little think. See if you can write down maybe um, two or three different ways you might classify or divide up these organisms. Well, maybe you picked uh, all the things with fur in one in one group, or maybe you picked all the things with legs. Maybe you picked the things that grow out of the ground. Um, maybe you classified the plant and fungus together. Now, all of these ways of classifying things might lead, um, might sort of have advantages and, and disadvantages. So I really just want to start you thinking about how do you do this systematically? Well, one of the first people to do this kind of systematic classification of organisms um, was a guy called Lin Linnaeus. I'm going to look at him in a second, but first of all, let's just define these terms, which you should write down. So classification uh, is the arrangement of organisms into groups of various sizes on the basis of shared features. Now, taxonomy is one way of classifying things, and it's mainly concerned with the physical similarities and differences to uh, classify things by just kind of looking at their appearances, really. And then later on, not in this lesson, but in another lesson, we're going to be looking more at phylogeny, which is how we classify organisms based on their relationships so that um, closely classified or organisms are also related through evolutionary time. So let's look at Linnaeus, the father of classification. So he was around uh, between 1707, born in 1707 and died in 1778. He studied botany at a university called Lund University, uh, and here at this university he's got a statue, uh, sort of recreating what he might have looked like back when he was a student. He worked in many European cities, uh, including London. Uh, in fact, all these little red dots here are places that he worked, so Lund University he studied and was over there. Um, and his interests during his sort of study period widened from botany, which is the study of plants, to include the systematic classification of all living things. He really wanted to develop a system for categorizing all the life forms that he found when he went on various trips. I mean, he went on a trip to I think, Lapland, which was in the north of uh, Sweden and Finland, I think, uh, started classifying different plants there. And he wanted to know how he could sort of fit these in with the plants that he already knew. So he published this work called the Systema Naturae, Naturae uh, in 1758, and that was actually the 10th edition. Uh, so he kind of kept coming back to this work. Apparently the first edition was only about 12 pages long, 
Um, and then in this 10th edition, it had sort of 4,000 or so different organisms all classified by the system. So what was the system that he developed? Well, he basically developed this system. And this system went from kingdom down to species. So kingdom was a large group containing many different organisms. And the species was just, you know, just a, a group of a population of very similar organisms that could interbreed, um, which is the definition of a species. So larger groups going up this way and smaller groups going down this way. Now we keep the system pretty much the same as it is uh, today, but um, over, over time, since he proposed this system, we've had to include one further uh, group above it, which is called the domain, which is a really, really large group. Uh, so let's look at that now. So to really unpack this way of uh, classifying things and the, the levels of classification, I want to think about how we are classified. And when I say we, I mean human beings. So here's a lot of human beings trying to get into Oxford Circus uh, tube station. And the first thing to mention is that all human beings are the same species. And we're going to look at the history of um, human evolution in a few later lessons. But for now, we're all the same species. So this here represents the three domains uh, of life. And actually, these three domains of life are bacteria, sometimes called Monera, the archaea bacteria and the eukaryotes. Eukaryotes. Now, it used to be thought that bacteria and archaea, well, they didn't, people didn't know the difference. But actually, when they studied, people started studying cells in detail and looked at um, the, um, the, the very fine detail of the cell structure, they realized that archaea and bacteria were extremely well, extremely, extremely different, actually. Uh, and I wouldn't look too in too much detail at these um, labels here. I'm not actually sure if these are all entirely accurate there, but um, it's really the biochemistry of the membranes of the archaea that are very different from the bacteria. For example, um, they've even got a different membrane structure. They, some of the archaea don't have a phospholipid bilayer. They have a sort of lipid monolayer. So uh, it's kind of the chemical details that um, of these two different microorganisms that mean that we've split them into different living groups. Um, now, the eukaryotes, of course, have bigger cells. They have uh, nuclei. So eukaryota, eukaryota actually in Greek means true nucleus. Eukaryo means true nucleus. So eukaryotic cells have a true nucleus and they have um, membrane bound organelles, which uh, bacteria and archaea don't. So we are a eukaryote, that's our domain. And in terms of our kingdom, we are in the kingdom animals. OK, so this is our kingdom. So let's delve deeper and continue classifying human beings. So we're in the kingdom animals, domain, eukarya. What about the phylum? Well, here are all the animal phylums. There's a ton of them. Uh, and we're in the phylum chordates, okay, or chordata, which means that we have uh, basically backbones, okay? So uh, a backbone is, uh, you might have heard the word vertebrate. So chordata is a slightly larger group than, than vertebrates because it also includes animals that have a sort of nerve cord down the down the kind of back of the body which isn't necessarily um fully kind of a, a bone but there are other animal phylums which don't have this this uh, nerve cord down the back of the body for example mollusks things like squids or cnidaria which includes things like jellyfish let's go deeper so we know that we're chordates so if we go further in, we can see what class we are. So out of the vertebrates, there are these main classes, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And hopefully you're familiar from, with the main features of these uh, vertebrate groups from Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. With mammals, we have hair, um, we give birth to live young, more or less, um, and uh, we also produce milk. So what about within the mammals? Within the mammals, we have various different orders. For example, primates, uh, which is the group that we are. We also have things like proboscidae, which includes elephants, carnivora, which includes um, well both canines and felines, so sort of cats and dogs, and rodenta, rodentia. So, so we're in the primate order. What about within that? Well, within the primate order, there are many different families. Um, so here are the families of primates. The sort of one of the, the least known about are the sort of lemurs, indries, uh, and oh gosh, I can't even pronounce that. Dorbentonididae, Dorbentonididae, um, which are found mainly in the island of Madagascar. Uh, and then we've got the um, sort of older New World monkeys here. Uh, and then we have the apes. So this is a, an ape and ape and humans here. We're on the same sort of family, actually, the great apes and humans here. 
These ones are interesting, tarsiers, uh, those are really cool uh, animals, and one of the only insect-eating um, primates. Uh, together with this thing as well, I think this is this, this looks like an eye eye to me. Uh, Google those two uh, animals if you want to see some cool primates. All right, so what about within the hominidae? Within the hominidae, we have several different genus genuses. So we have the genus Pan, the genus Gorilla, genus Pongo, and the genus Homo. So out of the genus Homo, there is actually only one species, us, um, Homo sapiens, but there used to be more. There are a few different um, species within Pan, within the genus Pan. We've got Pan, uh, we've got, oh gosh, uh, Pan troglodytes is the chimpanzee, and then we've got another one, which is um, uh, Pan bonobo, I think, which is the bonobo chimpanzee. Um, and we've got a few different species of gorilla, for example, the Western lowland and also the mountain gorilla. So finally, we get to the species. And the species for us, uh, well, our species name is Homo sapiens. So we can see that we have some other kind of distant relatives that used to be in our um, genus with us, like, for example, Homo neanderthalus, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, or handyman. And there's another one also not on this slide here called Homo floriensis, which is a sort of quite a miniature, miniaturized sort of human species that lived up until quite recently, really, a few thousand years ago on the island of Flores in Indonesia. Okay, so if that's something that you're really interested in, I do recommend this book here. It's called The Evolution of the Human Story by Dr. Alice Roberts. Uh, sort of goes into all the um, evolutionary relationships which led to us Homo sapiens here. And we'll talk a little bit about this later in another in another lesson, but this is just a little image of how we evolved and how we're related to our, to our distant, distant uh, relatives that are extinct and also to the chimpanzee, which of course is still around today. So can you remember that order? Take a second, pause the video, see if you can write these down in the correct order or just say them out loud. What was the order of the different class uh, levels of classification? Did you get it right? Let's have a check. Here you go. So we have domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Okay, that's something you need to memorize. So let's see if you can do it again without any prompts at all. Can you say it now? Can you say it back to me? Okay. All right. So you also might want to come up with some sort of mnemonic device to, to try and remember that. Two mnemonic devices that I've heard is, um, uh, did King Philip come over from Great Spain or dinner, king prawn curry or fat greasy sausages? Those are two different ones that you could use. And I'm sure you can find loads of loads of other ones online to help you remember, memorize that. So in those last two levels, the genus and the species, um, we kind of put them together to create something called the binomial name. So all living species on our planet are, are referred to by two names, which tell us the, the genus and the species, the last two levels of, uh, of classification. So it uses the Latin or Greek names, this binomial system. Uh, the first name is the generic name, and this is the genus to which the species, to the organism belongs, for example, Homo, for Homo sapiens. Uh, it's kind of similar to the surname of a person in a way, and it gives you kind of like a general kind of, uh, well, the kind of, uh, it's not the family name in terms of the, uh, the family of classification, but it gives a general sort of idea of what type of organism that is. And then the second name is the specific name. This is a bit similar to the first name of a person in a way. So we are Homo sapiens, and our distant um, ancestor now extinct, Homo neanderthalus, uh, is no longer with us. You may remember at the beginning of the lesson, I showed you these pairs of animals and I asked you to think about which one, which pair of these is the most closely classified uh, and therefore related. Now we already got rid of the great white shark and the uh, ichthyosaur uh, because we said that one of them is ex extinct uh, and they're really distantly related. But what about these ones that we've got left? First of all, let's look at the domain and kingdom of them. Well, actually all of them are the same domain and the same kingdom. They're all eukaryotes and they're all animals. What about the phylum and the class? Well, here we have some differences. They're all chordates, what you might call vertebrates, and they're all mammals. But two of them are sort of a, quite a different type of mammal, which we'll see when we go down a little bit further. This one is actually a marsupial. Uh, this is also extinct, actually. Uh, they died out uh, around about 100 years ago. I think this was a photo of the last one that was held in a zoo. I uh, can't remember the exact year, but it was sort of the early 1900s. Uh, and this one is a what's called a monotreme 
which is also an Australian uh, species. Uh, and it, it's a very odd kind of halfway mammal in that it lays eggs. It does produce milk, but it lays eggs. Um, another close another close relative of this is the duckbill platypus. Okay, so if we go down, we can see that in the mammals, we've got carnivores. This one is a marsupial, proboscidae, uh, hyracoidae, eulipothipla, and monotremes. So we can see that the hedgehog here uh, and the echidna are actually quite distantly related. They're not in the same order. Um, and we can see, in fact, all of them are not in the same order here at all. But actually, these two, amazingly, are the most closely related. So this proboscidae and the hyracoida are quite closely related orders. Um, and if we looked at the, when did they separate in evolutionary, um, their evolutionary history, these two separated relatively recently compared to the others. If we just fully re reveal uh, the full species names of these, we've got, um, here we've got the Canis lupus, this we've got Thylacinus cynocephalus, Loxodonta africana, so this is the African elephant I've, I've shown here, Procavia capensis, which is called a rock hyrax in, in more common uh, speech, this is a European hedgehog, Ariaceus europaeus, and this is the uh, short-beaked echidna, there's a couple different varieties of echidna. So the answer was this one, uh, which is pretty weird. Um, and is a problem with this kind of taxonomic version of classification, just looking at animals, you would never have realised that these were two quite closely related. So, pretty much finished there. What I'd like you to do now is look over your textbook page 279. You could make some notes um, on that textbook together with this presentation. And then I'd like you to answer these, uh, these questions that they've got in the textbook there. Pause the video, take a few minutes, and I'll put the mark scheme up in a second. Here's the mark scheme. How did you do? Um, I'll let you green pen your work there. Um, and if you're doing this, if you're one of my students, please take a picture of uh, your green pen work and then send it to me on uh, Teams, please. So uh, let's just review the syllabus uh, and make sure that we kind of know what we should. So this was the first lesson of a new unit, which is all about classification and evolution. I'll let you read the kind of overview of it there. But specific learning outcomes for today were, do you know how species are classified? to include the taxonomic hierarchy of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, and domain at the very top. And then do you understand the binomial system of naming species and the advantage of such a system? So I didn't really talk about the advantage of that so much, but one of the advantages is that scientists around the world speaking different languages can all use the same um, names, whereas if you were to use the sort of the, the name hedgehog, uh, in different languages. I'm sure hedgehog would be a lot of different things, probably not hedgehog. Okay, so there's the syllabus points. Uh, I hope that's been um, explanatory for you, uh, and I'll see you next lesson. Bye.